If a farmer or rancher were to take a steer to the auction barn right now, depending on the weight of that animal, they would receive anywhere from $1 to $2 per pound. But if you were to walk into the store and you were to look at the price of beef and just the price of ground beef, it's anywhere from $3.50 to $4 right now. Why is it that the price of a live animal might be at $1 while the price of hamburger meat's at 4 Well, there's a simple explanation for that. And that simple explanation is the added value or the value that's added as that product goes through the marketing channel. So, one thing that we need to recognize is that the majority of the value of, ad, of farm outputs winds up going to brokers or assemblers. This might be an auction barn in terms of livestock. Most of them will go to these brokers. While a small amount might be retained for consumption, that might be the steer that you retain to feed out, or they might be sold directly to consumers. So you might have a couple people that want to buy fattened steers from you, buy it directly from you. But for the majority of the time, the, the most of the time, you're going to be selling those animals or any commodity to either a broker or a assembler or somebody of that nature. And what do they do with it? Well, you see the farmers, they'll sell to these assemblers and brokers. The assemblers and brokers, they turn around and they sell to processors and manufacturers who sell to these wholesalers, maybe other brokers, or chain warehouses. And then after that, they sell to grocery stores, specialty food stores, institutions, consumers, and then the military. So in each step, you're adding value. You see, what's going on here is after the farmers sell just a few head of animals to these assemblers and brokers, they're compiling these animals into large groups. And that adds value to the processors and manufacturers because they don't have to go and buy it from a whole bunch of individuals. They can buy it from just one group in a large sum. These processors and manufacturers, they're in the process of maybe taking that live animal and fattening it up and then turning it into beef. And then after that, that's going to add value by taking a live animal, which the regular consumer would not want, and turning it into a consumable product such as beef. So they're adding value. And then these processors turn around and they sell that beef to the wholesalers, brokers, and the chain warehouses. And then these wholesalers, they'll take these large, massive amounts of shipments and break it down into smaller quantities. And it's a smaller quantity that somebody like a grocery store might be able to sell. So they're adding value as well by helping with the logistics and breaking down those large amounts. Then the grocery stores, specialty food stores, these institutions, and then the consumers and military, well, frankly, they're adding value as well. The grocery stores, they add value. They add value because it gives you a nice, convenient place to go get your food. Think of how difficult it would be if every, far, or every consumer had to go directly to a farmer or rancher in order to get their beef. Think of how much of a logistical nightmare that would be. So each one of these steps adds value and that's a partially why or that is a main reason why we have a separation between that one dollar that a farmer is selling their animal at and the four dollars that they've got to go buy basically per pound of beef in the retail store because each step adds some kind of value next we're going to start talking about the structure of the food industry and when it comes to the structure the first thing that we need to realize is that the food processors, the wholesalers and the retailers, in all reality, those individuals make up a relatively small number of firms. Well, think about it this way. There's 2.1 million farmers in the United States. Do you think there's that many processors? Do you think there's 2.1 million retail stores in the United States? Well, there's less wholesalers than there are retailers, and there are less food processors than there are retailers. So as a just a raw numbers, there's a relatively small number of processors out there or wholesalers or retailers. That group makes up a relatively small number. But by that same token, they make up a substantial portion of the total industry sales because they're adding this value that we talked about up here. These assemblers all the way through the retailers, these processors all the way through the retailers, they are adding a ton of value to these agricultural products. So as a result, they make up a substantial portion of the industry sales. 
Now another thing that we must talk about and clarify is the difference between concentration and consolidation, how they work together and what they mean. You see concentration is how many firms, or rather not how many firms, but more along the lines of how big are firms? How big are the firms and how much of the market share do they control? And whenever we talk about concentration, we usually use this four firm concentration ratio. So what we do is we take the four largest firms and we figure out what percentage of the market do they hold. So whenever we're talking about concentration, and beef is usually a common example, when we say that the four firm concentration of beef, of the beef industry, the packing industry is 85% in 2010. So what that means is the four largest firms in the beef packing industry control 85% of the beef that is being processed. That's a substantial number right there. Then we also get into consolidation. Consolidation means that now there are less firms and the remaining firms are producing more. You're consolidating smaller firms together or maybe the larger firms are buying out these smaller firms consolidate them together and then these larger firms that are now consolidated are producing more. So we're seeing both concentration and consolidation within the milk industry. And we see that milk concentration. Remember we're talking about the four largest firms. In 1997 the four largest firms controlled 21 percent of the milk that was being produced. Just 21 percent. A little over a fifth. But by 2007, that number had risen to 46%. Now these milk producers, by 2007, the four largest milk producers were producing 46% of the U.S. milk as compared to just a decade before when only 21% was produced by the four largest firms. So that, what does that mean? That means that 21% less milk processing plants in 2007 than what there was in 1997. By 2007, there were 21% less milk producing plants. The number had fallen. And these, the milk plants that were, that were remaining are now pr producing 21% more milk than what they were before. So the number of milk plants have been falling and the processing, the amount that each one processed, has now begun to rise. Whenever we talk about milk consolidation, by, from 2007 and, or from 1997 to 2007, we saw 47 less, less farms, and they produced twice as much milk per farm in 2007 than in 1997. So we're seeing that these dairy farms, first and foremost, there was 46% less farms. The number of farms had fallen by 46% from 1997 to 2007. And the farms that did remain were producing twice as much milk per farm.